Welcome. The title of today's notes worksheet is Exponential Growth and Decay Models Day 2. This is just one last chance for us to go ahead and look at some great applications dealing with exponential growth and decay. And so we'll go ahead and take a look at some different variations on that piece. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started with the example one that you see at the top of your paper. And uh, we'll kind of start that process out right here. It says the amount of caffeine leaves the body at a rate of about 15.63% each hour. Suppose a cup of coffee contains 100 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, letter A, how much caffeine is left in the body after eight hours? Sounds good. All right, I think actually before solving for part A, why don't we go ahead and see if we can write a good exponential model for this. Then we'll go ahead and do the calculations that's appropriate for this problem. So remember, anything that increases or decreases by a constant percentage over a particular time frame can be modeled exponentially. In this case, it's decreasing by 15.63% per year. So this is exponential decay. And so we should be able to go ahead and write um, a function for the amount of caffeine. If it's okay with you, I'm just going to go ahead and put A for the amount there. Use whatever variable you'd like. And we have our initial value, which I think I saw as 100 milligrams. So let's throw that in for little a. And then here's the key, everybody. I would love for you to come up with a nice decay rate right in there. What is that B value that we are going to apply every single hour? So if you could take a moment and go ahead and write what you think that decay rate is, and then I'll grab my calculator and do the calculation that would be required here. Okay, well, let's see what you came up with. So I'm going to grab my calculator and sort of remembering this situ uh, situation, excuse me, where we take 1 minus the percentage decrease, so 15.63% would be 0.1563. And if I do that right there, I'm getting that as a good-looking decay rate. So I'm going to put that in, 0. 0.8437. And so at this stage, what we have is a model representing the number of hours that pass and the amount of caffeine left in the body. This depends on this, of course. And then why don't we just let the calculator do some of the work for part A. I guess I'll come back over here and usually kind of start out with the easier of the two scenarios. This would be given the input, can you come up with the output there? And so if I give the number of hours that have passed, we'll just go ahead and throw that into the mix. And again, I don't mind bringing my calculator up, but I would strongly encourage you to do the same. Uh, I've got the 100 times and then 0.8437, and we would be applying that decay factor every single hour. And so we're going to go ahead and raise that to the eighth, and we get, uh, it looks like about a quarter remaining, just over 25 milligrams when we started with 100. So I'll go ahead and write that in. I think I caught about 25.67 milligrams. So good looking exponential decay model. Nice and easy. That, that part shouldn't scare us at all. Letter B, I think um, some good algebra comes into play. So let's go ahead and get into letter B then as a result. How many hours does it take to reduce the amount of caffeine by half? So this 100 was kind of arbitrary. It's just I don't remember where I got this particular problem, but it's a good easy number regardless. And so we have 100 applying that decay rate every hour, and we want to see how long it'll take that 100 to get down to 50. That would be our half. And so we're going to go ahead and solve this equation here. Obviously, we have our issue with the variable up in the exponent, so why don't we go ahead and deal with that particular situation. First and foremost, everyone, divide by the 100 on both sides. Let's get that 0.5. And then I have this right here. That's good. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to kind of come up here as a result. Didn't leave myself enough room, but hopefully you can find some area to work in. And then, guys, how would you solve that particular equation right there? What would you do at this stage? So think about that momentarily, getting that T by itself. And we kind of talked about that process of taking this base to this exponent and actually rolling it on over to the other side and changing the equation from exponential form to logarithmic form. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do right here. I'm going to roll that 0.8437 over to the other side. As soon as it rolls on over to the other side, it changes from the base to this exponent to the base of this logarithm right here. And so we should get just that as our answer, as a matter of fact. So whatever log base 0.8437 of 0.5 is, 
that's going to be the number of hours that have passed. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up my calculator and I'll have to do the change of base formula. And if you could also calculate that, that would be great. If you are doing the change of base formula like I have to do, please remember it is log of the inputs and then divided by, don't forget to close that off by the way, log of the input divided by log of that base, 0.8437, and I've got my winner right there. And so it looks like the T value, which is now isolated nicely, looks to be just over four hours. I caught that basically, we'll see if that's the case. Good. All right, so letter A, given the input, come up with the output. Letter B, given the output, come up with the input. And by now, it should be pretty comfortable with all that algebra coming together. Nice. Now, on the previous lesson, we kind of talked about the fact that um, exponential models can be written based on two different representations. They could be modeled in base B, which I am a strong proponent of. All these applications work really well in base B. Or they can be written in a uniform base, what's called base E, um, that irrational number. And, um, you know, just exploring the two different representations is exactly what our objective is here. So let me just refresh just a quick thing right up here, and then we'll get started on the part C. So there's our base B model. Here is the identical equation just written in our uniform base E. And so what we kind of talked about is these two are the same, these two are identical, X and T are identical, and so what that leaves us with is that E to the K equals B. And so that's all. It's just the connection between the two different representations of an exponential growth or decay model. And so that's the connection between base E and base B. Now, we were working in base B, which I thought was great. And by the way, we'll work probably in base B the rest of this notes worksheet. But let's see what we have planned for this part C. Uh, it says write the exponential model in base E. So this piece right up here, I have my B value. Uh, should kind of come right over here. Here's my B value right here. If I have that piece, do I have an opportunity or a way for us to get that K value, what we would call either the continuous growth or the continuous um, decay rate? And so I just used my B value here, and then I'll solve for K. And I hope everyone's comfortable with this. This should work out pretty nicely in the calculator. How do we solve an equation like this? That E rolls on over to the other side beautifully. It really does. When it does, it changes to the base of a logarithm, and it would be the natural logarithm of 0.8437. And so that's all. That's the nice connection to be seen um, um, between those two models. I'm going to go ahead and grab my calculator to get this momentarily. And let's see what we end up getting. So I would do the natural logarithm, 0.8437, do that piece right there, and it should be, I'm going to round here to the nearest hundred, it looks about negative 0.17. And that's, if you remember correctly, what we kind of talked about on the previous notes worksheet is that if it's exponential decay, then that K value when you're working in base E happens to be negative. Kind of cool. And so you get about negative 0.17. Uh, as your K value. And what I would do just one more time right here, let me do box up the base B model, which is absolutely great right up there. Worked well with the information in the problem. Well, I would also say that you could go ahead and write that exact same model starting with 100 and then decaying exponentially with what we would call a t continuous decay rate of 17%, and so negative 0.17 raised to the T. And two different expressions of the same mathematical phenomenon. In this case, exponential decay. Nice, good example. Good way to kind of start it out here, refresh and do some good algebra there. I'm liking it. Okay, let's go get some variations on this. So as mentioned before, and by the way, again, we'll go base B pretty much the rest of the way here. I think it works best. I think that is the um, most consistent way to go forward with this. So variations of percent increase and decrease, and uh, if you don't mind, just kind of box up this piece right here. This is probably the most common variation that you would see. You're given a starting value. You're giving a value in the future, 
and you know that it grows or decays exponentially, can you go ahead and write a model? So uh, this just happens to be my, my parents' house. So I'll read example two and kind of go ahead and solve and see what their situation is. So example two, a family bought a home in 1976 for $142,000, recently valued at approximately $1.3 million. Uh, find the annualized percentage increase for the home. Okay, actually underline that piece for me. So annualized percent increase for the home. By what percentage is the value of the home going up from one year to the next year to the next year to the next year? And when we're talking about that particular quantity, what we're basically talking about, everybody, is B. So if you want to go ahead and put a little B right under that piece, that might not be a bad idea. And so that's what I want to find. What is the growth rate, essentially? So on your paper, if you get an opportunity, can you go ahead and just give me a Y equals A times B to the X? That's looking pretty good right there. And I guess what we're looking for is a way to find B. And I guess that means we're going to have to go ahead and plug in all this other information. So this would be a situation where we're given the initial value. My folks bought the home for $142,000. Okay. Now, again, what we're trying to find is how much has it grown from one year to the next over the time frame that they've owned the home. So it was recently valued. And by the way, I'll go ahead and just the timing of this particular video is the year 2013. I don't know if that helps or not, but I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. So in the year 2013, the value was approximated at this number right there. So let's see what we've got going. I've got uh, 37 years that my folks have been in this home. So after 37 years, the value of the home has increased to this value right here. How does that look in terms of just an equation dealing with the variables Y, A, B, and X? Good, yeah, I like it. So now let's go ahead and find B. And in this case, it looks like it's a two-step process. I think the first step for everybody is pretty intuitive. Probably want to go ahead and divide by the 142,000. And I don't have that on my paper, so I'm going to bring up my calculator here. And let's go for it. So one, make sure I have my numbers right, and then divide by the 142. And we should get that right there. Okay, so. The first order of business was to divide, and I got about 9.1549. So I'm going to put that on my paper, or on my board, excuse me, you put it on your paper. And solving for B, so I have that value is, is really the growth rate over 37 years, but of course, everybody, what we want is the growth rate per year. And so the question, of course, becomes how do I undo? raising this variable to the 37th power. Well, no logarithm, just let's be clear on that. We only use a logarithm when the variable is the exponent. In this case, it looks like we're going to go ahead and take something along the lines of a 37th root. Does that sound okay to you? 37th root. So that will undo raising it to the 37th, which should give me my B value right there. And then whatever this value is, that should be a nice, good, old-fashioned growth rate from one year to the next to the next. So let's go ahead and do that piece. I, I'm going to use my calculator. I'm trying to shortcut this a little bit. But please, uh, if you would, do it on your calculator as well so you can get a little practice with this. So everyone, please hit the 37. Then go under Math. And do you see the X root right there? So that's what we're looking for. The, this will say the 37th root of this answer right here. I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that answer is in so I don't have to retype it. And that looks perfect. Notice what pops up. Just a nice looking growth rate, 1 plus the percentage. We'll put it in both those terms. But let me just make sure I have mine. I've got about 1.0617. I think that's what I saw, 0.617 basically. If you want to go a little further on that, that's fine. Sorry about that. So that's equal to our B. Actually, I'm going to put that right here. So 0.617. And then please just don't forget one thing here. In terms of our B value, that's great. 
that B value is made up of 1 plus the percentage, which of course means, and this I guess would kind of be our finalized answer if we want to express it in terms of a percent, basically the value of the home increased by about 6.17% every year over the 37 years. Great, take a look at that. Just make sure that clicks for you. Growth rate as our percentage right there. And by the way, if I gave this to you on any type of uh, quiz, test, or whatever you want to call it, any type of assessment, if you gave me this as an answer, that's perfectly fine. That would be the growth rate. This would be the interpretation in terms of a percentage increase. That's all. Excellent. Good problem. Okay. The next two kind of go hand in hand. So if you don't mind, uh, well, let's hold off on boxing this up here. I think I'm going to put a couple things in place first. So let's read this variation and do example three. Given the percent increase per time period, solve for the overall percent increase. All right. So actually, just kind of looking at this, the percent increase per time period, that right away tells me that we're talking about the growth rate, the, the B value. By what percent did it increase every time period? That is B. Okay, now what we're going to do is then solve for an overall percent increase over a lengthier period of time. Okay, well, let's give example three a try, see if we can interpret as we go through. So this is a fund that my wife and I invest in. And so it says the Fidelity Value Fund has a life annualized return of 9.45%. So since, uh, since its in inception, excuse me, um, the, on average, this fund has increased in value by 9.45% per year. Using that value, by what percent would the fund increase in five years? And by what percent would it increase in 10 years? Perfect. So we're given the percent increase per year, and then I want the percent increase over a, a longer period of time. Okay, well, let's go ahead and see what we have. Um, first of all, do you see any initial value whatsoever in this problem? I don't. Do you have any idea how much money my, my wife and I have invested in this fund? No. But does it matter? No. Nope. So pick a number. Just over the years, I've seen students probably pick 100 most often. I think that is a good, easy number to work with with a problem like this. I've seen also uh, students put in $1. Your call, doesn't matter. But basically, start out with a certain amount of money. I'm going to start out with $100, and I'm going to go ahead and apply my growth rate, and I'm hoping you all see a growth rate of 1.0945. That's the key. And what we're going to do is raise that to a particular number of years. Let's take a step back for a second, see if that works. Just in terms of my y equals a times b to the x, Start with a particular value, apply a growth rate a certain number of times. Is this going to be our final answer? No, not necessarily, but I think we can interpret it pretty easily. So let's go ahead and find out what that would produce. I'm going to bring up that calculator another time here. So let's do 100 times 1 1.0, what's that, 945, I'm going to raise it to the fifth. And we end up getting this much money. I'm going to go ahead and do kind of a dollars and cents on that. I saw 157.06. That would be the amount after five years. Now, uh, some students who might not understand how exponential growth works might say something like, oh, 9.45% per year for five years. Why don't we just take that percentage and times it by five? But everybody, is that how exponential growth works? Absolutely not. Remember, we're going to take 9.45% uh, of larger and larger values over the course of that five years. So it's going to be more than just multiplying it by five. Well, what is the percent increase? I guess I would ask you that. We can go back to kind of the middle school thing if you'd like. So to find a percent increase, we take the new minus the old over the old and times it by 100. You don't have to write that down, but just go ahead and take a peek at that. And the beautiful thing about starting with $100, as you can kind of see, is um, what happens to this 100 and that 100? Well, they cancel. 
And so now all you're left with is that numerator which just says, you know what, take that 157 and take away the 100 and guess what percent increase we have? 57.06%. So I like starting with 100 for this very reason. You can see how simple the calculation is and it enables us to shortcut it quite a bit. So in this case, um, basically go ahead and just take your new value and subtract the 100 and that will be your percent increase. So if you start with 100. All right, what do you say we do it for the 10 years and then move on to the next problem? So A equals, start with 100, growing by 9.45% every year for 10 years. Now again, exponential growth does not work like this. You wouldn't just take this and multiply by 10 and get an answer. What we want to do is raise it to the 10th and interpret what the percent increase would be. So our exponential model should be sufficient here. I'm going to go ahead and just retype one more time, 1.0945. Let's raise it all the way to the 10th. So over the course of a decade, take a look at that, we would have 246 and 69, 246, 69. So I would ask you this, see if you could put it on your paper, by what percent, so we have to be careful, by what percent would our money increase by over 10 years if this is the case? And if you look at this calculation over here and just kind of repeat it, what we did is we just shortcut it and say, you know what, just take it and subtract 100. So as a result, that would be the percent increase over the course of 10 years. Which, by the way, just FYI, which would be right in the middle of doubling and tripling, about two and a half times greater. So over 10 years, you would have um, more than double, but less than triple what you started with. Great. So a good problem here, having the B value and then interpreting what would happen in a longer period of time. Let's reverse. Now notice this one. Given the overall percent increase, solve for the percent increase per time period. As soon as you see this, guys, right here. Percent increase per time period. Everyone, if you would, put a little B right underneath. So notice, switching it around. This one is kind of a, a combination of the last two we've done. Definitely, everyone, if you could, on your paper, give me Y equals A times B to the X, and then we'll start working on the problem. So this would be uh, our first home. Um, I'll go ahead and just read the example here. So my wife and I actually did sell our home after six years at a price that was 60.58% greater than what we paid for it. What was the annualized return of the property? Great. So by what percent did it increase every year? And notice it's a little different than the couple previous problems there, but I think we can still work out this variation. So let's see, I, I don't have much to work with, but I do know I'm trying to solve for B. So that's going to be the unknown. Is everyone okay with that? Solving for B, which probably means to me, I need to put in a number for X, I need to put in a number for A, and I need to put in a number for Y. So let's start out nice and easy. We did have our home for six years. So raise it to the sixth no matter what. Now do you have any idea how much we bought our home for or how much we sold our home for? No, it's not given in the problem. Does it matter? No, not at all. So what do you say we make up a number? What's the easiest number that you can think of for this type of problem? I would say 100. You know, you can go with one. But basically, hey, we, we bought our home for 100 bucks. How cool is that? After six years, if it increased by 60.58%, what was the selling price, I guess? If it started at 100 and it increased by 60.58%, what would be the value after six years? And I'm hoping based on what we did on the last problem, you would see that we would just add 60.58. And again, the only reason we can do that is because we're starting with 100. It's just the easiest thing to do here. Is this a problem we can solve? Sure. In fact, we did it two examples ago. Hey guys, divide by the 100. You knew it was coming. So this would be 1.6058, and that's equal to b to the sixth. 
All right. So now this would represent for us the growth factor over six years. Wonderful. What I'm looking for, of course, is the growth factor per year. And last time around, I think we did a 37th root. This one is not so hairy. It's only the sixth root, but it doesn't matter regardless. Calculator is going to pull it off for us. So let's go get it. And so I'm going to do hit the number six. And we want the sixth root, so sixth root of 1.6058. There would be our 60.58% per, uh, increase over the six years. And we get a growth factor of about 1.082. Looks great. I would just add maybe one element to it, just me personally, in terms of uh, you know the, the problem asking, well, it doesn't even ask for a percent, but I would still include it as such. So 8.2% per year. As I mentioned on a previous problem, if you gave me this as a growth factor, of course I would take it. I kind of like this expression a little better personally, though. All right, good. So just as it says on your paper, just variations of percent increase and decrease. I like those examples. Good stuff. Well, let's go get um, the last two variations that we're going to see with exponential growth and decay, what would be called doubling and halving. I wrote a few things down to kind of get us thinking in the right direction. We're going to use base 2 for doubling. Something that doubles, we would multiply by 2. So something that doubles consistently over a particular time period, we would repeatedly multiply by 2. Repeated multiplication, of course, is an exponent base 2. Uh, we will be careful with the exponent, though. All right, so let's go ahead and do example 5. So a common inhabitant of human intestines is the bacterium E. coli. A cell of this bacterium, et cetera, et cetera, divides into two cells, so it doubles. It doubles every 20 minutes. And actually, if you can underline that piece for me, doubles every 20 minutes. And the initial population of a culture is 58 cells. Okay, good. So write a function for the number of cells after t minutes. Well, let's get this going right in here. Let's see if we can pull this off. I'm going to go n for the number of cells, not that it matters. And it is just strictly exponential growth. So let's kind of start that process out. We have our dependent variable equals to the initial quantity. So 58 cells started out. Now, here's the thing. It's doubling every 20 minutes, so I'm going to keep multiplying by 2. So what I'm going to do is apply a base 2 for this particular power right here. And here's the thing. I'm going to do it wrong for just a second, and I need you to think about how to correct it. So I'm going to raise it to the T, which would be kind of standard procedure dealing with these models. So 58 times 2 to the T. What's the one thing that's missing, and how are we going to remedy that? So think about that for a second, and let's go for it. Well, I guess the question is, I didn't include any of the 20 minutes here, so where does the 20 minutes go? And I guess here's the situation, what I'm seeing. What I wrote so far on my board is that this is going to double, and if t is the number of minutes, I would apply this base 2 every single minute after one minute, after two minutes, after three minutes. But I don't want to do that. I only want to apply this base 2 every 20 minutes. So what am I going to do to this exponent to accommodate exactly that situation? What am I going to do to the number of minutes in order to make this double not every minute, but every 20 minutes? And if you kind of think about it, if I take that exponent and divide by 20, I might be on to something. Because now, after 20 minutes, if t is 20, how many times will I have doubled? Once. And that's what it says, doubling every 20 minutes. After 40 minutes, based on this, how many times will it have doubled? Twice. So we take our time value and divide it by the doubling time. Well, let me fix that a little bit for you. So... The doubling time goes in the denominator. So watch that in action, if you would. Good. 
Well, let's go ahead and now just solve a couple of these. And so here's what I have, n equals, nice and easy here, given the input, we should be able to come up with the output. So seven hours, just be a little careful on that piece. I almost got caught off guard there, but seven hours, and remember our, our model is in minutes. So seven times 60 there should be 420, so something like this. Now again, you don't want to apply a base two 420 times, you want to apply it this many times. And so let's go ahead and do that piece. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my calculator there, get that value, and then we'll take care of business. So we start out with 58. And I'm going to apply that base 2, not 420 times, but 420 divided by 20 times. And that would be our value right there. That's huge. All right, so let me see if I can look at that number and get it down. And you can kind of see the power of doubling. After, you know, a fairly small time frame, it went from 58 cells to 121,634,816 cells. Again, sort of the, the power of exponential growth, especially with such a large growth rate, doubling. Nice. Let's go ahead and do part C. Using the model, of course, uh, in this case, given the output, so I'm hoping you're all right with this piece where I'm going to give you N and you're going to solve for T. So let's just go ahead and do some algebra that requires us to solve for that variable up in the exponent. There's our model, N in relation to T. Hey guys, I'm hoping you're comfortable going ahead and dividing that on over. It just so happens I have this on my paper, so I'm going to go ahead and use it rather than hitting the calculator again. But I'll take the next step on the calculator at least. So everyone divide by 58 if you get a chance there. And I get about 344.8276. And that's equal to 2 raised to the t over 20. Okay, now how do I solve in this case? Variables up there. Hey, now we should get some good practice on this. Take that 2, guys, and let's roll it on over to the other side. I'm going to go ahead and come up here. When that 2 rolls on over the other side, it changes from the base of the power to the base of the logarithm. So log base 2, 344, 8276 equals t over 20. Can we get this from the calculator? Sure. Should we probably multiply by 20 after that? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to go ahead and just get that from the calculator on my end. You guys do the same if you can. I have to go change a base on this, but that's all right. So I have log of the input, 344.8276. Close it, divided by log of 2. So log of our base, which is 2, and I get that piece right there. So don't forget, multiply by 20, and this would be the number of minutes. Wonderful. Take a look at that calculation, guys. Make sure you are totally able to execute that piece as well. I get about 168.59 minutes. Ah, if it interests you, go ahead and put that in hours. Just divide by 60. Eh, if not, no big deal. So doubling. Again, just one more thing on that exponent. We didn't want to double it every minute. We wanted to double it every 20 minutes. So I take the number of minutes and divide by 20. Great. One more variation. So there's doubling, and there's what's called halving. Same exact situation, except instead of a base 2, this is going to be exponential decay, where we're going to be using a base 1 half. Notice, same little care needs to be taken. Be careful with that exponent. So my science background is probably a touch rusty here, so why don't I just kind of read what I have on the paper, and then we'll go ahead and do example six, which I like. So living things constantly consume carbon through photosynthesis for plants and for animals' ingestion of those plants. The atmospheric ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon-12 remains consistent at one part per trillion. So if something is alive, one trillionth of its carbon atoms will be carbon-14. Once a plant or animal dies, its carbon-14 is no longer replenished, 
and carbon-14 is radioactive and unstable and has a half-life of, here we go, guys, so it halves every 5,730 years, if you can underline that piece, which means that half the atoms will turn back into nitrogen over that period, and that rate of decay is key to gauging age. So that's constant, and that's um, how carbon dating is done. So example six, this happens to be a famous cave in, in France. In fact, there was a documentary recently um, about that, and I think I have a clip maybe I can show you um, that shows some of the information on this. So let's see. Uh, it's called the Chauvet cave, cave, I believe, in southern France, contains some of the oldest prehistoric paintings ever discovered. Samples taken from torch marks and the paintings themselves were shown to have about 2.6% of the original carbon-14 present. Estimate the age of the paintings. Great. Well, guys, we're going to do another exponential growth model. I'm sorry, decay. Exponential decay, my fault. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. Uh, in this case, it doesn't give an amount of the carbon-14. It gives a percentage. And so I guess at the moment of death, I guess it can be argued that you would have 100% of the carbon-14 remaining. And so when the sample is taken so many years later, that 100% goes down, in this case, to 2.6%. So is everyone all right with that piece? Starting with 100, and after a certain number of years, the dependent variable, the amount, gets down to 2.6. Now, what we know about is not how much it decays per year, but it, that it halves every 5,730 years. So we're going to use our base one half. I'm going to do it wrong for a moment. I'm going to raise it to the T. Think about what this would imply, of course, though. If I raise it just to the T, then I would be applying this decay factor every single year. And I don't want to do that, of course. I want to apply it every 5,730 years. So just like last time, so the denominator is the half-life. You can put that in. That probably would be beneficial. So whatever the half-life is, is really the denominator of the fractional exponent there. Good. Now let's just solve. Bring that on over. Divide by point, or 100, you get 0 0.026. And I'm just going to change this to 0 0.5. might be a little easier for me to work with. Not that it matters. And that's the equation we're solving. I'm hoping at this stage it's just pretty automatic for you. That 0 0.5 is going to roll on over. And when it does, it becomes the base of our logarithm. And just don't forget that t over 5,730 drops down beautifully, as a matter of fact. Just make sure after you get this logarithm that we do go ahead and multiply by 5,730. So I hope the model makes sense. Let me just run through that one more time, and then I'll just do the calculation. You start with 100% of the carbon-14. It halves every 5,730 years, so you apply that decay rate that, many, um, that often. And we want to know how many years it takes for that 100% to get down to 2.6%. So let's calculate it. And again, this might be a slight oversimplification of um, the actual cave itself, but I think it is pretty close. I don't know how close they got in terms of um, being able to date those paintings, but I think they were able to ballpark it pretty well. Oops, I think I've, I'm off a decimal there. There we go. So log of the inputs divided by log of the base. Got that. Multiply it by 5730. And sounds about right. Again, just according to this information, should be about just over 30,000 years old. Excellent. Let's see if I have it available here. Just curious. There we go. Let's see if I can get this to play. So just hopefully it's on your screen there. It's just a quick clip of, of that um, documentary that I talked about for this particular cave. I'm going to hit play and see what happens, see if it works. So you can kind of see this piece. Hopefully you can kind of see some of those paintings there. It's kind of cool. Nice. I'll kind of stop that. And again, if you get an opportunity, um, you can kind of look that up. It's what's called cave. Oh, 
Cave of Forgotten Dreams. And uh, it was a documentary just on exactly that cave. All right, well, why don't I kind of stop it at that point? Some great applications dealing with growth and decay, just really a wonderful way to, to wrap up this particular unit. So thanks for listening, and let me know if you have any questions on what you're working on.